in the power of the Spirit. We are in our series on the Holy Spirit. And today's message is in the power of the Spirit. And the subtitle, as Sherman already let you know, is the fierce urgency of now. You know, the Holy Spirit is our leader and our guide. He reveals to us what we are to do, what we are to say, where we are to go, if we are open to listening to his voice. The other day, I was actually sleeping, and I awoke with these words, the urgency of now. And I said, what in the world is that? And I started looking through all kinds of like is that was it a sermon I listened to is it in the is it in the scripture where is it and I found out that it is a statement that was a part of a speech that was given by Dr. Martin Luther King on August 28 1963 Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. delivered his landmark I have a dream speech on the Lincoln Memorial in Washington, D.C. at the March on Washington for Civil Rights. And at that time, he was just 34 years old when he gave one of the most notable addresses in American history. In his speech, he warned the listening crowd, we are now faced with the fact that tomorrow is today. We are confronted with the fierce urgency of now. In this unfolding conundrum of life and history, there is such a thing as being too late. This is no time for apathy or complacency. This is a time for vigorous and positive action. Procrastination is still the thief of time. Procrastination is still the thief of time. We must move past indecision to action. Dr. King not only wrote about and spoke about, but he also lived in the fierce urgency of now as if he knew he had no time to waste. At the age of 26, after finishing his doctorate, I believe at Boston College, in April of 1955, he went directly to serving as a leader in the Montgomery bus boycott. You see, Dr. King knew why he was on the earth and to what aims he was to devote himself and he did that for the benefit of us all everybody say the fierce urgency of now now you might notice right here that I have what's called an hourglass and really, it's not an hourglass, it's a 15-minute glass. <laughs> but I'm going to use it, and RJ is going to help me this morning to illustrate how time, you know, Steve Miller Band said, time keeps on slipping, slipping, slipping into the future. So RJ is going to watch. I'm going to turn the glass over. And the, time, and, the, and the sands are going to go out. And RJ's going to watch it, and he's going to flip it back over and say, time is almost up every time that, that sand gets low. And when he says time is almost up, we're all going to say time is almost up. I wonder if Dr. King knew that pursuing God's purposes would lead to his early demise. On April 3rd, 1968, at Mason Temple in Memphis, Tennessee, 
amidst death threats. He courageously delivered his mountaintop speech. Like a modern day Moses, he declared, well, I don't know what will happen now. We've got some difficult days ahead. But it doesn't matter with me now because I've been to the mountaintop. And I don't mind. Like anybody, I would like to live a long life. Longevity has its place. But I'm not concerned about that now. I just want to do God's will. And he's allowed me to go up to the mountain and I've looked over and I've seen the promised land. I may not get there with you, but I want you to know tonight that we as a people will get to the promised land. And I'm happy tonight. I'm not worried about anything. I'm not fearing any man. My eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. But the next day, just under five years from his I Have a Dream speech, Dr. King was assassinated on April 4th, 1968 at the age of 39. What would you do if you knew you only had five years left to live. What if you knew you only had one year left to live? The fierce urgency of now. And I wonder what Dr. King would have said about the ending of Jim Crow. You know, they did a march with a funeral with a casket saying, here lies Jim Crow. I wonder what he would have thought about the rise of African-American leaders across all spectrums of society, about a black family being in the White House, about the first female vice president and Supreme Court justice of color. I wonder what he would think about us worshiping together today of different ethnicities and different ages coming from different economic backgrounds. I wonder what he would say about the desegregation of Sunday mornings. I wonder what he would say about the African Americans and the Caucasians and the Europeans and the Guatemalans and people from all nations protesting police brutality and rallying for justice after the death of George Floyd. These were sights that King could only have dreamt of. But 51 years after his seed and his words and his life went into the ground, we have seen what he only dreamt of. And who knew the seeming weakness of love, passively resisting hatred? Who knew that walking instead of taking a bus? Who knew that nonviolence, being beaten, being hosed down, allowing dogs to attack us, and being imprisoned rather than fighting back would mean release for millions of people and freedom? Who knew that indignities would bring dignity and that sit-ins at lunch counters and freedom rides would bring justice. Dr. King was gifted by God to be a scholar, to be a prophetic orator and an apostolic leader. But why are you here? Why do you have the gifts and the abilities that you have been given by God? If you turn to the book of Romans, the Apostle Paul in Romans 15 shares that he knows why he was created, that his aim and that his ambition, the reason he lived his life in the way that he did was so that the Gentiles, when we hear that word Gentiles, it means the non-Jewish believers in Jesus Christ. How many in this room are a Gentile? Everybody who's not Jewish and believes in Jesus Christ. 
So were it not for Paul, none of us would be saved. None of us would know Jesus in the pardon of our sins. He lived the way that he lived. He did what he did so that the Gentiles would hear about and receive the gospel of Jesus Christ. In Romans 15, verse 16, he says, By God's grace, I am a special messenger from Christ Jesus to you Gentiles. I bring you the good news so that I might present you as an acceptable offering to God, made holy by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit makes us holy. So I have reason to be enthusiastic about all Christ Jesus has done through me in my service to God. Yet I dare not boast about anything except what Christ has done through me. Bringing the Gentiles to God by my message and by the way I worked among them. Verse 19 says, they were convinced by the power of miraculous signs and wonders and by the power of God's Spirit. We're convinced by the Spirit of God. They were convinced by signs and wonders. And he said, in this way I have fully presented the good news of Christ from Jerusalem all the way to Illyricum, which is now Serbia. The Holy Spirit was at work through Paul's witness, through his preaching, and through his life. We talked about that in Acts 1-8 last Sunday how the power of God is for us to be witnesses of him in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the earth. So Paul said in verse 20, my ambition, or yours might say my aim, has always been to preach the good news where the name of Christ has never been heard rather than where a church has already been started by someone else. I have been following the plan spoken of in the scriptures where it says, those who have never been told about him will see, and those who have never heard of him will understand. Aren't you glad that Paul did what he was supposed to do? Aren't you glad that Paul followed the Holy Spirit? Aren't you glad to have received the word of the Lord? And in the same way that we as Americans, and particularly African Americans, have benefited from the aims, the intentions, and actions of Dr. King, and countless unnamed others, who invested and offered their lives in sacrifice for freedom and justice. In that same way, we who are Gentiles, who according to Ephesians 2 and 12 were without hope and without God in the world, have been blessed to be engrafted into citizenship and the covenant of God's promise by the power of the Holy Spirit. John 16, 8, Jesus tells us about the Spirit, saying he convicts the world of sin and convinces us of righteousness. In John 16, verse 13, he says, when, the, when he, the Spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own, but he will tell you what he has heard. And he will tell you about the future. The King James says he will show you things to come. So Dr. King and the Apostle Paul had prophetic purpose revealed to them 
They heard from the Holy Spirit what they would do and what effect it would have on humankind. Paul wrote that even Jesus himself knew that his crucifixion would mean the salvation of the world. But it, even the rulers of his time could not see what God had revealed to him. But God had planned through what seemed to be Jesus' weakness to show forth his mighty power. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 2, 9 through 12, that that is what the scriptures mean when they say, No eye has seen, nor ear has heard, and no mind has imagined what God has prepared for those who love him. But it was to us that God revealed these things by his Spirit. For his Spirit searches out everything and shows us God's deep secrets. No one can know a person's thoughts except that person's own spirit. And no one can know God's thoughts except God's own spirit. And we have received God's spirit, not the world's spirit. So we can know the wonderful things God has freely given us. No eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind can conceive, no heart can imagine the things that God has prepared for those who love him. But God reveals those things to us by his spirit. What has God revealed to you? Dr. King and Paul knew God's will for their lives by the revelation of the Holy Spirit. They weren't just marking time. They weren't just passing through on this earth. That's why Dr. King could speak of the fierce urgency of now and tell us that tomorrow is today and that there is such a thing as being too late. Everybody say that out loud. There is such a thing as being too late. I can show up too late, too late. The opportunity of a lifetime only exists within the lifetime of the opportunity. So my message today is an urging, it's a warning from the Holy Spirit. We can see the aims and the ambitions and the intentions of Dr. King and Paul. We can look at other people that are notable and see them living out the things that God has for them. But what are your aims? What are your ambitions? Why are you here? Dr. King didn't know he only had five years to live when he delivered his I Have a Dream speech. Would he have done anything differently if he had known? Would you be doing anything differently if you knew you had limited time? But we out here acting as if we're going to live forever. But we won't. As we grow older and our hair turns gray and our bodies start to change and our, our minds feel like they're the same age as in our youth, but our bodies are telling an entirely different story. You blinked your eyes and you turn from 20 to 40 or 50 or 60 and all the while things that God has given you to do or even your own desires remain undone. 
Psalm 90 and 12 says, teach us to number our days that we might apply our hearts to wisdom. Teach us to realize the brevity of life so that we may grow in wisdom. And the CEV says, teach us to use wisely all the time we have. It's sobering, ain't it? Italians used to try to invite people to seize the day by saying this, this little phrase, memento mori. Everybody say that. Memento mori. Remember that you will die. Remember that you will die. Because we are not immortal on this side of heaven. And the only time we have to accomplish God's purposes here is now. Faith operates in the now. Hebrews 11.1 1 says, now faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. I might not see it yet, but I prepare for it now. I might not see it yet, but I speak it out now. I declare it now. I act as if it's so now because faith is in the now and we have to have a fierce urgency about now. We have been lulled into complacency about the things of God. We have been lulled into comfort about our own dreams. And we say, I'll get to it tomorrow. But tomorrow is not promised to any of us. Some of us are struggling. What are you saying? Time is almost up. Everybody say, time is almost up. We say, I'll get to that tomorrow, but tomorrow is not promised. We got regrets about the past, but we cannot go back and change the past or the decisions that we made in days or years gone by. And we do not know what will happen tomorrow. So the question is always, what are you going to do with today? With each 24-hour segment that you've been given, are your days filled with purpose or are they filled with social media and binge watching and being lazy? What are you doing on each and every day when each day passes? Have you done something that moves you towards God's will, his purpose, or your own desires and dreams? Some of y'all used to watch the, 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 uh, the soap operas. And they said in days of our lives, like sands of the hourglass, these are the days of our lives. What would you do if you knew you only had six months left to live? This is something that I'm giving y'all for homework. Write it down. What would I do? if I knew that my life was going to end by January 1st of 2023. Because we got six months left at the end, of, to the end of this year. What would you prioritize? What would be most important to you? What legacy would you want to leave in the earth? What thing that has been waiting on the shelf that you need to go back and dust off? What prophetic utterance have you received? What is it that God has been pulling and tugging on you and you know your heart is so constrained and it's constricted because you haven't even touched that thing, you haven't even done that thing? What is it that you would do if you only had six months to live? Those are the things that should have your attention right now. Those are the things that you should be writing down. Those are the things that you should be applying your activity towards. Let those ideas guide the rest of your year. 
Write them down if you have to. Get your little recorder out and say them if you have to. Write that music, write that book, do those things. You've been waiting long enough. RJ said, time is running out. How can you ensure going forward, because you can't do anything about the past, that the rest of your life will have little to no regret? How can you ensure going forward that the rest of your life will have little to no regret? Have you been waiting for conditions to be perfect before you'll do what God told you to do? That's not happening. Because you need the Spirit to do it. Are you waiting for other people's agreement? That also may never happen. Some of us have let what someone said to us in five minutes ruin our entire life. Some of us have let what someone said to us in five minutes ruin our entire life, our future, our calling, because they said whatever they said on this given day, in that given moment, and it contradicted what God said, and it contradicted what you want, but you said, okay, I'm going to let them win. What? Over God? We've given over years, even decades of our lives, because someone said something negative about our dreams, about how we look, about what we will never amount to. And their words have overruled God's words to us. But today, you can decide something different. You can choose to let God decide why you are here. You can choose to let God decide what you are to do. You can choose to let God decide why you have your gifts. You can choose to let God decide what you're capable of above through his spirit's mighty power. In him we move and live and have our being. Not in our children, not in our spouses, not in any other people, not in our bosses, not in our co-workers, not in our neighbors. In him we live and move and have our being. Because Joseph's brothers in Genesis 37 envied him. And they hated the favor that he was holding. And when he told them his dream, what God had showed him, they laughed him and scorned him. And they did all that they could, even tried to kill him to prevent his dream from happening, to block him from being a blessing to the entire then known world. And little did they know that the gift that God had placed inside of their brother was actually meant to save their lives. And sometimes the people that are naysaying and people that are hating and people are, they don't even realize that what God has given you will save their lives will put them in a place where they're supposed to be, will cause them to have contentment and fulfillment. And they're talking about what they don't really understand. Your gift could save your critics' life and their future. But you've been letting what they said in five minutes dictate how you're going to live your life. People who were close to me, when I presented my vision to them, the paper is from 1995. People who were important to me laughed at my visions and my dreams that God had given because they were too impossible for me to do. And I let it derail me. They laughed because when they saw what I'd written down and no, you can't see it. 
They thought it was impossible. And their ridicule of me caused me to think the same thing. But of course it was impossible. Because they're God-given ideas that require God's power, that require God's intervention. And there's no way that I could do these things on my own. And so many of these things have actually already happened. But then there are some that I left to languish on this paper without applying any faith or any agreement. I stopped and I just didn't even try to even think or see if some of these crazy things on this paper could actually come to pass. And so I only tried the things that I felt like were realistic for me to do. Someone with my limited skills, my limited expertise, my limited abilities, my limited connections, my limited resources. These close and important people didn't believe in me or the God in me, and they told me and laughed to my face. And then me, I began to see myself through their lens, and my hope and my faith turned to timidity, turned to fear, turn to despair, turn to disappointment, turn to frustration. And then as I looked at other people doing all the things that I had on my paper and accomplishing all the things that I desired to do and inventing all the things that I was supposed to do, and I became frustrated, I became envious, I became jealous. But I left that on the table because of what they said. They probably even don't remember the day they said it. Sometimes like Joseph, when you put that risk out, putting your dream out to those you love, you only have to be laughed at or dissuaded one time. You only have to be told once that you're not beautiful enough, not smart enough, not gifted enough, or that they oppose your dream. Words were spoken to bind me, to make me doubt who I was called to be and what I was commissioned to do. And at the time, I didn't have the spiritual wherewithal to stand against, not the people, but against the words. To refute them and to say, no, those words, you know, when he said, Satan, the Lord rebuke you. When Peter said, no, Jesus, you can't go to the cross. He said, no, that's not coming from the Lord. That's coming from the devil. And though I love you, the thing that you're speaking is not true. So the spirit of truth has to rise up in us and say, no, God is saying this about my life and I'm going to pursue it whether you say it or not because I'm going to agree. If I'm going to agree with anybody in this earth or this heaven, it's going to be God. I didn't have the spiritual wherewithal at the time to refute them and to continue with what God had called me to do. But now, everybody say, but now, I do. And the Holy Spirit is here today to expose Satan. John 8 and 44 calls him the father of lies. Revelation 12 says he's the accuser of our brethren. And he is cast down and we overcome him by the blood of the lamb, by the word of our testimony. And we do not love our lives even to the death. Sometimes you think that if you don't have this person agree and approve that you're going to die. But you ain't going to die. And they ain't either. As you pursue the thing God has called you to, you all will live. Everybody say live. Live. So.
sometimes the lies that Satan's been telling come through those closest to us. Because for real, we really wouldn't listen to outside folks closely. Because these outside folks, we don't really care what they think. It's the people that are important to us, whose words, we hang on their every word. And has anybody ever crafted your life around or stopped doing or start doing something because somebody that was close and important to you said, felt a certain way about yourself because somebody close and important to you said, Quite frankly, we've been living in our feelings about that. Anybody been living in your feelings about that just a little bit? Maybe even a lot. Or living out of your feelings. Or not living and suppressing your feeling. Or not feeling at all. And then I get there and I see other people doing the thing that I know I'm called to do and I feel some kind of way about the fact that it's, and then I think like God is punishing me, but God ain't really punishing me. I'm just not strong enough to stand for what God has told me I was supposed to do. We're not waiting on God. God is waiting on us. And as long as we suppress and repress these feelings, I can't feel the loss of the grief of the years, the decades, the the time I spent following the words of other people and not doing the thing that God has asked me to do. And now my hair is gray and I think my youth has been wasted in the most productive, I think the most productive time. I've lost all that time. But God is saying you can be like Caleb and you can be like Joshua and that don't have to be the most productive time because I'm a God who's in charge of time. I can collapse time. I can redeem time. I will restore the years that the canker worm and the palmer worm have eaten. I will give you back time. He gave Hezekiah 15 more years to get to done what he wanted to get done. God is the God of time but now I gotta heal my feelings cause I've been numbed and I've been bitter and I've been frustrated and I've been disappointed and I've been jealous and I've been envious and I've been angry at the person who said the thing and they don't even remember the day they said it heard Bishop Dale Bronner say you heal by feeling and you heal by facing and you heal by releasing so now I gotta acknowledge that I feel it I had to do that this week Sometimes you're looking at stuff and you see social media and you're like, oh man, I'm, why am I feeling this? Why am I struggling so hard? I bless them. They're doing wonderful. This is wonderful. Oh, I bless them. This is a great, this is a great. Why am I feeling the way that I'm feeling? Why am I feeling? Time is almost out. Why am I feeling why I'm feeling? Because time is almost done. That's why I'm feeling the way I'm feeling. It's passing me by and I'm watching them seize the day. You heal by feeling, you heal by facing. Spirit of truth causes you to tell yourself the truth. Yeah. And I'd be like, I'm all right, I'm cool. You know, any way you bless me, Lord, I'll be satisfied. All these, you know, you know how we say, 
make excuses for why we don't enter into the thing that God is calling us to. And you heal by releasing. I release them. I forgive them. It really wasn't about them. It was about God maturing me and bringing me to a place where I could stand in my own truth. Where I could fight for the thing and the spirit that God had put in me. Where I ceased living for the opinions and the approval and the smiles of people. That's what I did when I was a child. When I was a child, I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. I understood like a child. But when I became full grown, when I became a man, when I became a woman, I put away childish ways of thinking. Sometimes it takes tears to release. Sometimes it takes screams to release. Sometimes you got to write 5,000 words in your journal and get it out of you. Sometimes you got to talk to a therapist. Yes, I said sometimes you got to talk to somebody. Because some of us have been running from what we don't want to feel, face, or release. Pastor Michael Phillips said, the pain that you are not willing to transform, you will transmit. The pain that you are not willing to transform, you will transmit. It's going to eke out to your brothers. It's going to eke out to your sisters. It's going to eke out to your children. It's going to eke out to your spouse. It's going to eke out at your job. It's going to start to manifest ways in your body and gastrointestinal problems and migraine headaches and, and your body's all tight and all these things are happening because you haven't felt, you haven't faced, and you haven't released. And you know the people who are telling you you can't do it. But who are the people in your life who've been telling you that you can? Who are the folks who invest in you, who love you, and who speak life into your dreams? Who agrees with what God is saying to you and about you? Maybe it's time that you might listen to them more than you listen to your own doubts, your own fears, and these naysayers. And maybe you say, Pastor Sedell, I don't have anybody. I don't have anybody speaking life into me and speaking life into my dreams and, and affirming what God is saying to me. Then listen to the Holy Spirit. Listen to the Word of God and focus on your destination. You know, when you're going out of town, you're going down to Disneyland, you're not, you know, like, hey, everybody, you don't put it on social media. Look, I'm on 75. Ooh, I'm on 95. You know, you're like, I'm going to Disney World. Your focus is where you're going to end up. And for some of us, our mouths and our attention and our focus needs to be on where God says we're going to end up. Did you know that sometimes the critics and the naysayers are actually a sign that you're on the right track and not the wrong track? And I'm so glad that the words and actions of Joseph's brothers did not ultimately prevent God from getting all the glory and honor, getting him to his destiny, allowing him to become the deliverer that he was meant to be. The fierce urgency of now. Everybody say time is running out. Now is what I have. Amen. 
every day. The hourglass is running. Maybe you want to buy one of these. That's to remind you. Get them at Target. It happens so quickly. Those of us who are older now, you're like, how, how did I get this age? How did, how did I get to this stage? And, and these last 20 years, it's like a blur. What can I say has been accomplished? What can I say has been left relationally? You know, one of the most precious things that I had before my mother passed was a couple of videos that I have of her talking and interacting with me. For some of you, that might be something that you want to do as time slips into the future. Memoirs you want to have, photos you want to take, places you want to go, things God is calling you to do. This idea of legacy. I read this article the other day. You know, we're really all into, we all want to get rich and we want to be famous and we want everybody to know our name. And that's a wonderful thing. And maybe it's the calling of some people. But we're in 2022 and I would love for anybody to name the number one pop star of 1922. Or the governor of Ohio in 1922. Because 100 years from now, nobody might know your name. 100 years from now, they might not even know Beyonce and Jay-Z. So now, what's going for real be important to you? Legacy you leave in the earth, children, grandchildren, what's going to be important to you? Moving the gospel, because I tell you one where every word and every motive and every action that we do will be recorded is in heaven. And we will receive eternal reward for following what God has asked us to do. But we're all concerned about what people who won't even remember us. I went to a funeral on Thursday. Lived life for over 60 years. The funeral is an hour and 15 minutes. And people are given two minutes each to talk about an over 60 year life. So now every day in every conversation, we are planting seed like Martin Luther King. And there are seeds that he did not get to see the full fruition of, but because he invested his entire life in what God wanted him to invest it in. And then the countless other people who were hosed down, who were, who dogs were sent after him and died and lived so we could enjoy the freedoms that we enjoy. Who are you going to be in this earth? And how worried are you that everybody gives you claps? Tomorrow's not promised. Now is the acceptable time. Now is the day of salvation. And if you have not yet accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and entered into a life believing that he lived a spotless life, that he died on the cross of Calvary for a sin, that he shed his blood that we might have eternal life, that he's soon to return back for a church without spot or blemish or wrinkle. If you are willing to confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead by the Holy Spirit's power, the Bible says you will be saved. And if you're saved, then you receive the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit begins to talk to you about why you're here on the earth and 
why you've been given what you've been given. You're a parent. You're a person who has a gift and ability, education, a neighborhood to save. The Holy Spirit can answer all of those questions and bring you into a quality of life. And if you haven't done that and you're in the room, we invite you. The ministers are coming up. And if you're online, I invite you to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and the pardon of your sin. I also invite you, you might have already done it, but type in the chat, time is running out. There's a fierce urgency of now. And there is a possibility that I can be too late. So, Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for this word, and we thank you for your spirit. We want to be in your will. They used to say the safest place in the whole wide world is in the will of God. God, you are working in us both to will and to do your good pleasure. Some of us have said yes to your will and yes to your way and yes to your plan and yes to your timing, and others of us have resisted. Some of us have allowed other people and other influences to dissuade us from the thing that we know deep down inside is the thing that we're called to. Some of us have allowed money and prestige and, and all kind of things to dissuade us from the thing that we know we're called to. We won't take less money. We won't do the thing that God has called us and trust you for our provision because we are consumed with the world. I'm asking for freedom. I'm asking for release today. Even of the feelings of frustration and disappointment and anger and fear. And I'm asking for this next six months to be devoted to the things that you have called us to do and the people that you have called us to be. Why don't you lift your hands right there as a sign of surrender and of believing God for what you have not seen and what you have not done, that his power will meet you, not by might nor by power, but by your spirit. We tried it on our own. We fought it on our own. We tried to cajole. We tried to manipulate. We tried to control people. But now we want you, spirit to lead and guide us, to reveal truth, and to empower us to fulfill your will. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to thank you for joining us at the Warehouse Church. This is a place where transformation begins, where we belong, where we serve, where we grow, where we heal, and we are transformed. I'm looking forward next week to hearing some testimonies about what you wrote down and what you began and how you finished something that was on the shelf that you never got to but now you see that God is calling you. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and give you peace in Jesus name. Amen. The altar is open. The ministers are here to pray with you.